بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه أما بعد. So the topic that I want to talk about is uh, one that honestly I think is very rare to hear about Sira. And in my humble opinion, and all of you know that I uh, teach Sira classes and I, I've done Sira many times for different Islamic channels and networks and I have a regular halaqa in English which is uh, put onto YouTube about the Sira. And Alhamdulillah, I do consider it to be one of my specialities of, of study and research. And in my humble opinion, one of the beautiful things about the Sira is that the Sira is something you can always go back to no matter what time or era or place you're living in. And you can extract new benefits and new morals and new lessons in every single society of the world. In other words, the way that we read Sira here in America, we will find certain benefits, discover certain parallels, certain issues that we will be able to benefit directly from that perhaps some of our scholars living in Muslim lands, they haven't seen. And that's the beauty. The seerah is always fresh. It's always new. It should always be read and reread. And some of the scholars of the past, they said, we used to teach our children seerah the way that we would teach them to memorize the Quran. Literally, it's like a subject they need to memorize. They need to fully understand. So in today's lecture, I'm going to talk about the seerah from a very different perspective, inshaAllah ta'ala. And it's going to be primarily, but not exclusively, primarily through the lens of a pagan, a mushrik, an idol worshiper. Believe it or not, my whole talk is going to center around an idol worshiper. And his interactions with the Muslims and the Prophet Sallallahu and how those interactions, we living here in North America, we find a lot of benefit in. And the person that I have in mind, is somebody by the name of Mut'im ibn Adi. Mut'im ibn Adi. Quick show of hands, how many of you know this personality? Be honest here. How many of you know this personality? Mut'im ibn Adi. I would say less than 5% of the audience has raised their hands. Mut'im ibn Adi is not one of the well-known figures. Very well, let us go from the very beginning. Mut'im ibn Adi was one of the chieftains of Mecca. He was one of the big guys. He was one of the big shots, the heavyweights. And he was the chieftain of the tribe of Banu Nawfal. And the Banu Nawfal were one of the sub-tribes of the Quraysh. The first instance that we're going to talk about that deals with Mutim ibn Adi is in the famous treaty that the Prophet ﷺ signed before he became a prophet. And that is the Hilf al-Fudul. That is the Hilf al-Fudul, also called the Hilf al-Mutayyabin. This treaty, it was signed 20 years before our Prophet ﷺ became a prophet, i.e. he was 20 years old. Our Prophet ﷺ was 20 years old, and Mutim ibn Adi is one of the signatories along with him, right? So this is his first story, that he is one of those who signs the treaty along with the Prophet ﷺ. What happened? What is Hilf al-Fudul? Listen to this story. This will be the first story that we have, and inshallah, I'm going to try to cover five stories, all of them about basically about Mutim. I'm going to try to cover five stories if time permits. The first of them, Hilf al-Fudul. What happened was, when the Prophet was 20 years old, one of the Arabs who was a trader came to Mecca. And he was from a low tribe, the tribe of uh, Zubaid. He was a Zubaidi. And the Zubaidis ranked very low on the scale compared to the Quraysh. The Quraysh were way up there. And he sold an item he sold an item to one of the elite of the Quraysh. Expensive item, and this was before the Hajj. And this nobleman said, you know what, I don't have the money now. Go do your Hajj, come back, and I'll give you your money. So he went, he did Hajj, he came back, and he said, okay, I've done Hajj, can you give me my money? He said, you know, I don't have it, I'll come back tomorrow. Came back tomorrow, he goes, yeah, you know what, I'm in debt right now. I really don't have it, try another time. Give, give me another few weeks. And he kept on coming and he's delayed from returning back to his home country until he realizes, you know what, this guy's not going to pay me my money back. No matter what I do, he's not going to pay me my money back. So what does he do? He goes to other leaders of the Quraysh that help me out here. I'm a poor guy from Zubaid and I've come for Hajj. I've sold my item to this man and he's not giving me my money back. 
Every one of them made an excuse. You know what? We really can't intervene. Sorry, I can't help you. I'm sorry you, this happened, but nothing I can do. Every one of them made an excuse. So what did he do? He turned to propaganda. He turned to the media of that time. And what was the media of that time? Who can tell me? Poetry. That was the media of that time, poetry. And he composed a harsh criticism of the Quraysh. And the goal was to spread this poem across Arabia. And he stood in front of the Kaaba when the Hujjaj were all there. And he started reciting basically a very harsh satirical poem about the Quraysh. And it's a very beautiful poem, by the way. And in it, he says, basically, I, I, obviously the Arabic is really advanced and complicated, no point saying the Arabic, but basically he says, of what use is it to pride yourself in your ancestry? Of what use is it to pride yourself in your ancestry when you don't show that pride in your akhlaq and manners? Of what use is it to be living around the Kaaba, around the house of Allah, when living around the house of Allah has not helped you to stop cheating and lying and, and stealing. What's the point of living around the Kaaba if you're going to take advantage of people like me? And it was a really powerful poem that shook the Quraysh to the core. And they knew this is going to spread everywhere because he has a valid point, because the truth is on his side. So what happened? Our Prophet's uncle, our Prophet was a young man. He's 20 years old. So he's not in charge yet. He's 20 years old. Our Prophet's uncle, his name was Zubayr ibn Abdul Muttalib, he said, you know, we have to stop this. This should not be allowed. So he convened a gathering of all of the chieftains, including uh, basically Mutab ibn Adi and all of the other chieftains. And they gathered together and they decided we will in effect institute a new constitution. A law. Up until that point in time, there was no law in Mecca. It was the survival of the fittest. We will institute a law. What will that law say? That law will say that every single person of the Quraysh must honor their contracts. And if they don't, then the rest of us will unite in forcing that man to give up whatever he needs to give up. In other words, for the first time, they instituted a local government. Realize that before this time, there was no government. There was no police station in Mecca. Somebody robbed you, steal, somebody raped. You couldn't call out anybody except your own blood relatives. It was tribalism. That's the whole point of tribalism. So this new law was meant to avoid any person being taken advantage of. No cheating allowed anymore, no stealing allowed. And the youngest person in that room was our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you know, they couldn't read and write. So what they did was they publicly announced this law and they dipped their hands in a big vat of perfume, big fat of perfume. This is how they would do it. Back then, this was your X. This was the X signature that if you don't, you know, they couldn't read and write back then. So what do you do? You go in public, you dip your hands in perfume, and then all together, all simultaneously in front of the Kaaba, you rub your hand in front of the Kaaba on the same spot. This is your X on the, on the mark. You get the point, right? That this is how they publicly acknowledge, right? And our Prophet was the youngest person who was there. Now, many years later, when the Prophet was almost 60 years old in Medina, he recalled that treaty that took place 40 years ago. And he said, I was there when they signed that treaty. And I was a part of that treaty. And I would never substitute my place in that room for a herd of red camels, which basically translates in our times, for a million dollars. What he's saying is, you could have given me a million dollars. I would never have given up my spot in that room. I'm so honored to have been a part of that treaty that I thank Allah for having been there and having signed that treaty. And listen to what he said. If I were called to uphold that treaty right now, I would be the first to uphold it. If I were called to uphold it, if people said, oh, those who signed the Hilf al-Fudul, the Hilf al-Mutayyabin. By the way, that's why it's called Hilf al-Mutayyabin. Mutayyab means you dip your hands in Tlib, which is perfume. Mutayyab means the perfume treaty. So it's called the perfume treaty because they dip their hands and they rub their perfume. And it's also called Hilf al-Fudul because when the businessman, the rich Qurashi, the nobleman of Quraysh, when he heard what they had done, he got so angry. He said, 
What business is it of theirs? This is no business of theirs. And to say this in Arabic, he goes, هذا أمر فضولي. This is none of their business what I did. أمر فضولي. So they called it حلف الفضول. So it's called حلف الفضول. It's called حلف المطيبين. So the Prophet was so proud to have witnessed this. He said, you could have given me a million dollars and I would not have given up my place in that room. And if you were to have called and if I were to be called to uphold that treaty, then I will be the first in line to do so. Now, by the way, this treaty was uh, used multiple times in Jahiliya. And the first time it was used was, believe it or not, uh, one of the ladies of Mecca, one of the, the, the young girls of Mecca, she was in fact kidnapped by, by uh, another powerful trader. Uh, sorry, excuse me. One of the ladies ca had come to Mecca. She wasn't a Qurashi. She had come with uh, Hujaj. She had come with her father and family. And one of the rich noblemen of the Quraysh, he fell in love with her. He saw her and he literally kidnapped her in order to do that evil deed with her. And he refused to hand her back to her family because her family is from a low, tra low caste, a low tribe. And he says, I am a Qurashi, basically I can do as, my, as I please. And therefore the father pleaded to the Quraysh and the Quraysh gathered up the posse. They gathered the Hilf al-Fudul and they literally barged into the man's house and they rescued the girl and they gave her back to her father. So the Prophet is obviously very proud of this. And he said, I was there, I witnessed it and I would never have given up my place for a, a million dollars. Now, that's the first story. How do we benefit from the story? How do we derive lessons from uh, the Hilf al-Fudul here in North America? Well, many benefits. But of the most important benefits relevant to us is that this clearly shows that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was proud, was honored to have gotten involved in the social affairs of the community he lived in. Hilf al-Fudul is not a purely Islamic treaty. It's not a da'wah treaty. It's not a treaty about preaching and teaching and, and, and Islamic causes per se. It is about justice. It is about eliminating oppression. It is about the rule of law. And our Prophet even as a prophet, somebody can say he tried it when he wasn't a prophet, don't use it. We say, in Sahih al-Bukhari, he is proud to have witnessed it. And he said, you know, if I were to be called right now, I would be the first in line. I would be the first to execute the Hilf al-Fudul. So he was proud of it even as a prophet. What does that show us, brothers and sisters? In my humble opinion, it shows that many of us have misread the seerah. How so? Our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was very active in society. He was known for social causes. He was known for upholding the truth, justice, the rule of law. He was known for fighting against poverty, for helping the orphans, for being kind to the people, for standing with the oppressed against the oppressor. He was known as Al-Amin before he was known as a rasul Think about that. He was known as Al-Amin before he was called a rasul And that is why when he opened his mouth to teach and preach, the people loved him, knew him, respected him. They could not blemish his character. They rejected his message, no doubt about that. But they could not reject him. They could not taint his reputation because he had a solid reputation for 40 years in Mecca. Amongst them is Hilf al-Fudul. We, on the other hand, brothers and sisters, and I'm sorry for being so harsh and blunt, but we need to say this reality. And I don't mean it in a personal manner. But wallahi, we have made a big blunder in this land. Why? When's the last time you saw a Muslim speaking out against injustice in society? When's the last time you saw a Muslim running for a, a type of cause that eliminates racism? When's the last time you saw a Muslim that wanted better schools for their kids and he's running for the PTA for the local school? When's the last time you saw a Muslim talk against prostitution, against drugs, against this and that and make it a communal issue? The fact of the matter is most of us as Muslims, we do not associate these causes with Islam. And for us, Islam is foreign. Raise money for Kashmir, raise money for Palestine. Please nobody misquote me. I love, these are my brothers and sisters. 
But just like we raise money for Palestine and Gaza and whatnot, we also have to realize these are our people as well. A little bit here, a little bit there. That until the people know who we are, until they see it in our actions, that this is a person he cares about us. You know when our Prophet was kind to the orphans, there were no Muslim orphans to be kind to. Correct? When he's kind to the poor, there are no Muslim poor, he's being kind. And that's the point, brothers and sisters. Poverty, oppression, injustice, racism, stealing, prostitution. These are not just causes that harm us. These are societal problems that affect Muslims and non-Muslims. And for us to stand up and challenge them, like Jubayr ibn Mut'im, he was a part of those people, like our Prophet ﷺ, this is not just da'wah, it's not just PR, it is a part of the message of Islam. It is a part of the message of Islam. And until we understand this point, we will always be viewed as foreigners in our own land. Who are you to come and preach us a religion? Where are you when there's a disaster, when there's a catastrophe? Where are you helping the, the, the current problems we're actually facing? Now you come, you preach your own theology. We don't know who you are. Whereas our Prophet ﷺ was Al-Ameen before he was a Rasul. And that's the whole point, brothers and sisters. We need to have a reputation of being concerned, of being aware of, of what's happening in our community. If we don't help other Muslims and non-Muslims, if we don't help society at large in matters that they're facing, poverty, racism, oppression, how do you think they're going to accept from us a new religion and theology? Think about it. So this is the first benefit we derive. The treaty of Fudul, Hilf al-Fudul, the treaty of Mutayyabin. We need to find equivalents. We need to find Muslims here in this land who get involved in projects that are for the societal benefit. And this will be, can you imagine brothers, can you imagine if there is uh, some type of racism going on in this, uh, let's say in, uh, in the Twin Cities an incident happened. Right, that becomes a, a topic of concern. And a muhajjiba stood up and said, you know, I'm gonna champion this cause. I'm gonna make sure that whatever happened never ha happens again. And she's interviewed on the media and she comes and she goes, this is simply not allowed and we're not gonna tolerate this. She doesn't mention the word Islam. But her character, her message, her da'wah, that is the real da'wah of Islam. Without having opened her mouth about Islam and Muslims and whatnot, her character is showing the people this is the reality of Islam. That's the first lesson we learn. The second incident that I want to do doesn't have an immediate moral, but we will get back to the morals of it. The second incident involving uh, Mutim ibn Adi is the boycott. You all know the boycott of the Prophet when he was boycotted and he lived for two years in the valleys and he was outside of Mecca that the Prophet and the Muslims were boycotted. Now, how was the boycott broken? Some of the Quraysh felt that this was going too far. And so they gathered together, the two, three of them who were sympathetic to, not to the Muslims, but sympathetic to justice. Some Quraysh, some idol worshippers said, you know, how can we treat our relatives in this manner? They're our cousins, they're our brothers, they're our tribe. How can we let them starve to death? How can we deprive them from water? This is inhumane. None of them were Muslims. These are all pagans. And one of them was Mut'im ibn Adi. Mut'im ibn Adi was one of those who said, for how long are we going to allow our own kinsmen to live in this dismal fashion? So what did he do? He and a group of the other Quraysh, there was four or five of them. They said, you know what? We will break the contract. We will break the boycott. We're going to demolish the boycott. How did they do that? They set up a really uh, interesting, if you like, uh, way of doing it. And that is that one time when all of the Quraysh were gathered together in their uh, parliament, if you like, in front of the Kaaba, one of them stood up and he said, for how long are we going to starve our own relatives to death? These are our own cousins, our own kith and kin. I for one say we need to break this boycott. Before Abu Jahl, before Abu Lahab, before any of them could say anything, Mut'im stood up and he said, you know, I totally agree. They're, th this boycott is completely unjust. I never agreed to it in the first place. And then a third person stood up and then if all of these are planted, right? 
all of these are planted people. That three, four, five people stood up and Abu Jahl start, started to shout and Abu Lahab and others. But the four or five who stood up, they continued shouting and Mut'im was one of them until finally Abu Jahl said, this is a plot you guys agreed to do. I figured this out. This is a plot you guys agreed to do, but the plot won. They won in this plot and the boycott was effectively broken. What does this show us? It shows us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes uses people who are idol worshippers, non-Muslims, but who believe in justice, who believe in truth. He uses them to bring back that truth and justice. And Jubaid ibn Mut'im, sorry, Mut'im ibn Adi, sorry. Uh, Mut'im ibn Adi is one of those people. Jubaid is the name of his son, by the way. Jubaid accepted Islam. Mut'im never accepted Islam till he died. Jubaid ibn Mut'im is one of the noble companions. His father, Mut'im ibn Adi, never accepted Islam. And by the way, one of the other things Mut'im did, check this out, you're not going to believe the generosity of this man. He's a non-Muslim. He's an idol worshiper. Till he died, he worshipped an idol. Yet when he heard that the Quraysh boycotted the Banu Hashim, and he was a Qurayshi, he lived in Mecca, you know what he would do? He would purchase a camel with his own money. And he would load the camel with grain and with, with, with well, they didn't have rice, but with wheat, with all of this uh, barley and dates and water. And he would take it in the middle of the night to the valley where the Muslims were basically camped. And he would hit the camel on the back so the camel would go forward and they would find the camel. This camel would give them meat for months. They would dry the meat. It would give them dates. It would give them food. And were it not for Allah and then this type of regular generosity, the Muslims would have starved to death. Mut'im was the main supporter of providing food and he did it surreptitiously. He did it illegally. The Quraysh had banned their fellow Qurayshites from giving food to the Muslims, right? But Mut'im was one of those who said, I don't care what the law says. This is an unjust, illegal law. And so he was of those who would donate of his time and it, literally his money and he would send, this is a lot of money to give a camel. That's literally like uh, what a car would cost in our times. You know, $15,000 is basically, that's what a camel would cost, or what, our equivalent. And he would ladle it with food and water and send it in. This is Mut'im ibn Adi. And this shows us brothers and sisters that subhanAllah Allah has blessed people with good hearts even if they are not Muslims. Listen to me carefully. I know some of you are like, they, they don't understand this point, but believe me, this is the whole point, brothers and sisters. Just because you're not a Muslim, doesn't mean you have no good in you. Just because you don't believe in Allah and you are worshiping another God, that's wrong. That's kufr, and I'm not justifying it. But just because you're of another faith, you might still have a lot of good in other areas and avenues. And our religion says that those people who stand for truth and justice, we stand with them. Those people who are fighting unjust, uh, for, uh, uh, against injustice, fighting oppression, fighting racism. There are many in this land here in America, they are fighting against these racist oppressive laws like the Patriot Act. There are many who are speaking out against foreign policy of our own land. These are people, they might be atheists, many of them are atheists, they're agnostics, but they have good in them. They have good in them. You can quote me on this, brothers and sisters. They have good. They don't have the ultimate good. The ultimate good is the worship of Allah. Correct. I am not saying that they have ultimate good. But just because they don't have the ultimate good, they might have other shades of good in them. And those good, that khair in their hearts, should we not take advantage of that? Should we not support them? Should we not, like the Prophet ﷺ, did he not eat the food given by Mutam ibn Adi? Did he not take advantage of the generosity of Mutam ibn Adi? Of course he did. Why? Because it's common sense. Wallahi, I cannot understand some of our brothers and sisters. They say, oh, these kuffar, we should never do anything with them. These kuffar, this and that. Ya khibra, brothers and sisters, the Prophet ﷺ took advantage of good kafirs. Yes, you can be a good kafir. You can quote me on this, yes. What do I mean by the way? Don't misquote me. You can have good in many areas. Perhaps he doesn't have good in theology. Okay, I'm not saying his theology is good. But he can have good in supporting just causes. In fighting against injustice. We find this in the seerah. And when you find somebody like Mut'im ibn Adi, what should we do? We take advantage of them, we embrace them, we help them out. And we thank Allah for having sent somebody like this. That's another story of Mut'im ibn Adi. So the story of the boycott. The next story of Mut'im ibn Adi involves, and this is perhaps the greatest thing that he ever did for Islam. 
This is perhaps the greatest thing that he ever did for Islam. When our Prophet when his uncle died, Abu Talib, did he die as a Muslim or non-Muslim? Who can tell me? Non-Muslim. There's a wisdom in this, by the way. Do you know that wisdom? There's a wisdom in Abu Talib never embracing Islam. That wisdom is as follows. Abu Talib was the most respected Qurayshi alive. No one of the Quraysh was more respected than him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given him izzah and honor in his people. And it was his word that my nephew shall not be harmed. That caused the entire Quraysh to never lift a, 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 a finger against our Prophet sallallahu Had he embraced Islam, instantaneously he would have been disqualified from being the chieftain of the Quraysh. What caused him to remain a chieftain was his kufr, that he's still an idol worshiper. What caused him to still be respected was the fact that he's loyal to the traditions of his people. He is an ardent follower of idolatry. Had he embraced Islam, the protection that he gave to the process and would have become meaningless. Allah has his ways. Allah has his ways. And he sometimes utilizes ways we don't understand how. So Abu Talib dies. And who takes over after Abu Talib? Who's the senior most uncle after Abu Talib? Abu Lahab. Tabbat yada Abi Lahab. This is Abu Lahab. The uncle of the Prophet Abu Lahab. Do you think he's going to protect the Prophet Do you think he would give his word to say, Oh Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi even I just, though I disagree with you, you are a part of our tribe, you can do as you please. No, not at all. What he did was unheard of in Arabia. The equivalent of revoking the Prophet Sallallahu citizenship. That's what he did. And by the way, tribalism is thicker than a citizenship. Because it's your blood. It's your father. You can't change your father. It's your tribe. You can't change your tribe even if you wanted to. Abu Lahab, for the first time basically in Arabian history, he told the Prophet Sallallahu that you are no longer, he disowned him. That you are no longer a part of our tribe. Go find somewhere else to live. And that is why our Prophet ﷺ had to go to Ta'if. Because he had no, why did he go after the death of Abu Talib? Literally a few weeks after Abu Talib died, he had to go to Ta'if. Because Abu Talib's protection had been lifted. And Abu Lahab did not want to give him any protection. So he goes to Ta'if hoping that the people of Ta'if will embrace him, will accept him. You all know the story of Ta'if, correct? So he came back rejected by the people of Ta'if. And he had with him Zayd. Which Zayd did he have? Which Zayd? Zayd ibn Haditha. Zayd ibn Haditha. Who was his quote-unquote adopted son and then Allah said uh, uh, that type of adoption is not allowed. So he was, the, he was called Zayd ibn Muhammad at the time. At the time, he was called Zayd ibn Muhammad. Then Allah revealed in the Quran, "Udhuhum li abaim who in Allah." So they changed it back to Zayd ibn Haditha, Surah Al Ahzab, uh, sixth ayah. So the Prophet came back with Zayd, and he camped outside of Mecca. Zayd said, "Ya Rasul Allah, how are you going to enter Mecca when you don't have any?" Now, I mean, the terms used, the equivalent is you don't have an entry visa. This is what we would understand, right? How are you going to enter Mecca when you don't have permission? When you don't have somebody to sponsor you? Because back then you needed somebody to sponsor you. So our Prophet ﷺ said to Zayd that, O oh Zayd, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help his Prophet. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make a way out for us. I don't know how. He will do it. Then he sent a messenger. He sent an envoy to a number of the leaders of the Quraysh. First amongst them, he sent to Al-Akhnas ibn uh, Shuraik. And al Akhnas ibn, and he said that, can I come under your tribe? These are all sub-tribes of the Quraysh. He was Banu Hashim. He's now reaching out to the other sub-tribes. Can you adopt me? And al Akhnas gave an excuse. He then sent a, 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 a request to Suhail ibn Amr. And Suhail ibn Amr invented an excuse that, I'm sorry, I really can't. We have some 
issues with the Banu Hashim and I can't really get involved with this and I apologize. Both of them turned him down for false excuses by the way. They invented excuses. They didn't want to take the burden of sponsoring the Prophet against his own tribe. Then he sent a message to Mut'im ibn Adi. The same Mut'im we're talking about. And Mut'im ibn Adi said, come spend the night in my house. Come immediately to my house. The messenger came and goes, right now, take your bags, come to my house. So the Prophet spent the night in Mut'im's house. He doesn't have a house anymore. His house has been confiscated. His own uncle has kicked him out. His, he has no place to go. So he goes to the house of Mut'im ibn Adi. And the next morning, Mut'im has seven sons. Mut'im tells his sons, all of you, wear your armor. Get your swords, get your bow and arrow. All of you. And he wears his own armor. And they march to the Kaaba as bodyguards of the Prophet None of these people is a Muslim right now. They're all idol worshippers. Mut'im is not even from the Banu Hashim, he's from the Banu Nawfal which is a, another tribe of the Quraysh, but it's not the Banu Hashim. But he knows what's going on. He's a senior man. He's an elder man. He's seen it all. He's been there from the very beginning. He was a young man when the Prophet was born. He knows the whole story. So he wears armor and he tells his own sons to wear armor because he knows it's a dangerous situation. And they go in front of the Kaaba. They do tawaf, as was their custom that any time uh, they want to make a major announcement, they'll do tawaf. And the people are now seeing the Prophet and back, surrounded by bodyguard. All the people of Makkah come around, including Abu Jahl, including uh, Abu Sufyan. And at the end, Mut'im stand up, stands up and says, O people of Makkah, listen, I have taken this man under my shelter. Anybody who harms him has harmed me. That was a stance of bravery. That was a stance of courage. Where he put his own life and the lives of his seven sons online. He knows the tension. Abu Lahab is fuming because this is Abu Lahab's peer. Abu Lahab is one chieftain, he's another chieftain. Abu Lahab is fuming. He doesn't even know what to say, he's so shocked. Abu Sufyan stands up and challenges him. And Abu Sufyan says, O Mut'im, are you protecting him because you are his follower? Or are you protecting him because this is a decision you made as the chieftain? He said, no, I am not his follower. I don't believe in his religion, but I am protecting him as my right of the chief of the Banu Nawfal to protect him. So Abu Sufyan then said, in that case, we shall honor our commitment to you. Whatever commitments you make, that's our treaty. We have to honor it with you. And so for the rest of the two years that the Prophet was in Mecca, he was under the protection of Mut'im ibn Adi, not his own uncle, Abu Lahab. Mut'im never embraced Islam. That's why the Prophet, by the way, was looking where to emigrate, because he knows this is not a permanent situation. He never embraced Islam. And the Prophet and migrated to Medina, and Mut'im died a natural death a few months before the Battle of Badr. Before the Battle of Badr, by I think two months or so, Mut'im dies. The Battle of Badr takes place. And the miracle of miracles happens that a small band of 310 Muslims defeats a large army of over a thousand uh, uh, people of the Quraysh. And they capture 73 prisoners of war. And these 73 prisoners of war, they are going to bring in millions of dollars. Literally, every one of them brought in 4,000 silver coins. 4,000 silver coins, that's a large amount of money. Do the math, times 73. We're talking about millions of dollars are coming in. Notice, and this is the final story we have for Mut'im. What did our Prophet do? Mut'im's dead, what's he gonna do? Mut'im's dead now. But what did he do? He stood up examining all of these prisoners and they were all in front of him, tied up, bound, as prisoners are tied up. And he said, لَوْ كَانَ مُطْعِمْ بِنْ عَدِي حَيًّا ثُمَّ كَلَّمَنِي فِي هَؤُلَا إِنَّتْنَا لَأَطْلَقْتُهُ لَهُمْ If Mut'im ibn Adi were still alive and he spoke to me one word asking me to free all of these people for him, I would have done it for his sake. This, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, this is showing respect to an idol-worshipping kafir 
but who's done so much for Islam that he deserves as the Prophet. Now, this is literally like a medal of honor because he's dead. There's not even, what's the point of the process I'm saying this? Think about it. Ask yourself that question. Why would he mention a dead man? To repay him back the favors that Mut'im has done in his life. It's like a congressional medal of honor. It's like the Purple Heart. It's like something that's done to the deceased. That just to honor his memory. Mut'im is dead. He's now, he's died a kafir. You know where, where he's going to go? But he has done so much for Islam that he deserves that our Prophet gives him that ultimate respect. That had he just given me one word for all of these people in front of me, I would have freed all of them for his sake. Brothers and sisters in Islam, the conclusion that we have here is that we are living as a minority in North America. And there are a lot of Abu Jahls around us. There's a lot of Abu Lahabs around us. But there's also a lot of Mut'im ibn Adis around us as well. And the foolish Muslim can't tell the two of them apart. The foolish Muslim lumps all of them together. And he doesn't realize, you cannot treat Abu Jahl like you treat Mut'im ibn Adi. You cannot treat Abu Jahl like you treat Mut'im ibn Adi. Mut'im and the people like him, they might have wrong theologies, incorrect theologies. They might even end up in a place other than Jannah. Okay, fine, that's their business. But while they're on this earth, they have a lot that we can benefit from. While they're here, they have streaks of good in them. They have characteristics of good. And we have the same characteristics of good. And therefore, to join with them in fighting against a greater evil, to take advantage of them, our Prophet ﷺ, he got his visa stamped by Mutam ibn Adi. This is literally political asylum, literally in our times. This is political asylum. He got his visa stamp because it was rejected by Abu Lahab. So what does he do? Abu, that Mut'im sponsors him to come back to Mecca. Don't worry, I'll protect you. We in our times have so many political issues that we have to worry about. Islamophobia. Millions of dollars are being spent to smear our religion. You know, we can't win this fight alone. We're too small in this part of the world. We're literally 1-2% of this country. We need the help of every single person we can get. And there are plenty of people in this land who understand what's going on. There are plenty of journalists, of intellectual thinkers, even of politicians. There are plenty of people working on the hill in DC who actually sympathize with us. It is foolish on our parts not to take advantage of that. Worse, what really irritates me was when some of our more uh, conservative ulama and isolated, if you like, minds of the religion, they say it is haram for Muslims to go to help with the kuffar. My dear brothers and sisters, read the seerah. It's right there in front of you. I'm not inventing this. It's right there. Read the seerah. It is haram for Muslims to vote. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did more than just vote. He participated in Darul Nadwa. He was a part of the signatory treaty. And he said, I'm proud to have signed that treaty. And were I to be called now as a prophet, I will be the first. That was a treaty in the, pol in the political realm of kufr. Signed by all of them uh, were, were, were people who worshipped idols at the time other than our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he was proud to have been there. Brothers and sisters, it's time that we read through the seerah in a manner that we understand our situation here in North America. The people like Mut'im ibn Adi, the people, and there are many other examples, by the way, this is just one example I wanted to say. The people who helped, another example, by the way, is Abdullah ibn Urayqit, whom the Prophet ﷺ chose as his guide between Mecca and Medina, right? When there was a hundred camels on his head, you know a hundred camels is, wallahi, more than a million dollars for them, for us. More than a million dollars for us was a hundred camels for them. And he chose a pagan, non-Muslim guide. Abdullah ibn Urayqit was his name. Because they knew him, they trusted him. And he gave him a small fee, the fee of being a guide, which is a small fee, less than one camel. Because he knew that this was a man of his word. Even in this critical journey, the process of Abu Bakr and Abdullah ibn Urayqit, three people only, and they are walking from Mecca to Medina. He chooses a non-Muslim because that's the only person he could find. He was the most trustworthy, he was knowledgeable of the ways, and he had no problems taking the help of a kafir. Brothers and sisters, 
We're in very difficult circumstances here in North America. And it's perhaps because of those difficult circumstances that people like myself are becoming very critical of outsourcing our Islamic knowledge to people who don't live here. When muftis across the globe think they know American politics and our situation better than we do, honestly, I have to say with all respect that it's our fault for asking them even. It's our fault for going to those people. We need to find scholars locally here who know our situation better. There's a saying in, in Mecca, uh, there's a saying in Arabic that the people of Mecca know the valleyways of Mecca better than anybody else. The people of every land, they know their culture, they know their people, they know the ins and outs. And for the longest time throughout the 80s and 90s when I was growing up, it was like a considered fact that voting is haram, let's say. Voting is shirk, voting is kufr. For the longest time we heard this type of stuff. But then when you ask, what is really the evidence? Did our Prophet participate in non-Muslim politics or not? And it's obvious he did. Did the Sahaba do things in Mecca that would be interpreted in our times as being involved in the social fabric? Did our Prophet fight against oppression, injustice, racism? Of course he did. So then where is the harm? Us here in America doing the exact same things. Brothers and sisters, I'll conclude by saying this. If we want Islam to flourish here in North America, if we want Islam to be a respected entity, if we want Islam to become a part of the fabric of this land, and that is the only way that our grandchildren and great, 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 great grandchildren after them will be proud Muslims, is that Islam becomes a part and parcel of this fabric, of this country. If we want Islam to flourish in this land, you know what? we will have to become a part of this land like our Prophet ﷺ did in Mecca. Despite all of the racism, despite all of the Islamophobia, despite all of the prejudice, he remained in Mecca until his physical life was threatened. And even when he was kicked out, you know what the last thing is that he said when he left Mecca? He turned around, literally he turned around to face Mecca. He loved it so much. It is his country. It's his land. And he said in that, oh, oh Mecca, innaka la ahabbul biladi ilay. You are the most beloved city to my heart. And were it not for the fact that my own people kicked me out, I would never have left you. He would never have left Mecca despite the racism, despite the oppression, despite the slaughtering, despite the torture, despite the nudity. There was nudity outside of the Kaaba. Don't you know what, how they would do tawaf? You all know how they would do tawaf, right? You all know it's in the Quran how the Quraysh would do tawaf. They would do it naked. That's what the Quran says. Despite the alcohol, despite all of the vulgarity, Still, it is his land. These are his people. He's preaching the message of Islam to his kith and kin. Well, guess what? This is now my land. I live here. I was born here. I was raised here. I don't communicate in any culture and language as well as they do in this country and land. And the true land is not where my grandfather came from. It's where my grandchildren will live and die. And frankly, I am way more American than I am Pakistani. That's just a fact. And we need to start reorienting how we're looking at the future. What will your grandchildren grow up thinking and believing? What will your great, great grandchildren grow up? Will they even be Muslim? Will they be proud to be Muslim? If we truly want Islam to flourish here, brothers and sisters, we're going to have to have a whole different paradigm shift, a whole different vision now that we need to be a part of our communities, a part of this culture, a part of the fabric of this land, with the good and the bad, with the evil and the filth and the positive. This is the reality. Do you really think that this land is any worse than Mecca was? Wallahi, Mecca was more difficult to live in than America. Do we not agree? Are there any Bilal and Ab Ibn Abi Rabahs being dragged in the streets? Are there any Sumayyas and Yasirs being tortured to death like this? Alhamdulillah, it's not that bad compared to Mecca. Yet our process and remain there in much worse circumstances. And he considered himself a part and parcel of that land. Similarly, this is our land. And we have to accept it as it is, be a part of it as we continue to preach Islam. And the message of Islam is more than just theology. It is also actions. It is also fighting against injustice, oppression, racism. It is also being in the front lines for soup kitchens. It's also demonstrating to the people, you want better education. You don't want drugs in your neighborhood. You don't want problems 
prostitutes. SubhanAllah, brothers and sisters, when we're driving down the road, we see a filthy sign, a sign of fahisha, nudity. Wallahi, I am embarrassed as a father that my children are sitting in my car and they have to look at that sign. This is a cause Muslims, Christians, Jews, many people of decency will come together and say, you know what? We shouldn't have these evil advertisements that are advertising clubs and this and that where our children can see. We shouldn't have filthy images. This is not just an Islamic cause. It is a human cause. And whatever cause is a human cause, it becomes an Islamic cause. When we start championing those causes, then when I stand up to preach about Islam proper, which is theology, which is aqidah and whatnot, the people will say, we know Yasir. He was a part of making our environment drug free. We know Yasir, he was the one helping our kids for a better education. Let's see what caused him to do this. Let's see why is he uh, feeling this way. Let me see what his religion is. When we are known as Al Amin, when we are known as trustworthy people, before we start preaching the message, then insha'Allah ta'ala, the people will listen, will obey, and will accept Islam. Until that point in time, we're always going to be foreigners and the exotic other. Let us reread the seerah critically. Let us go through the seerah, insha'Allah ta'ala, with a different vision in mind. And that's what I hope, insha'Allah, I am doing in my own seerah lectures, which you will find online. Wa jazakumullahu khayran. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.